The gospel text this Sunday is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 through 41. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. Quote, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. I didn't know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated as we continue in the reading of, or going into the word anyway. Thank you, Father, for your word and for your spirit <clears throat> that dwells within us. You don't dwell within a building, but within your people. And it is a mystery that is far beyond our ability to understand or comprehend. But in your goodness and in your faithfulness, you reveal the truth of it and the reality therein. So now as we go into your word once again, may your spirit that is within us guide us into all truth as you so faithfully do. And give us hearts of obedience as well as minds. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The message today I've entitled Competing Interests. And um, the reason for that is, well, the focus of competing interests that vie for our attention in our lives, more precisely in our own minds. When we read the scriptures today, this is the account of, of the baptism that John records more than any other of uh, the other gospels in terms of its depth of, of context. There's a lot going on. And unlike our experience of baptism here, which generally takes place within a church service, if you're more uh, liturgical, if you will, you get a little um, certificate, you know, maybe a candle, something of that nature. And uh, you dressed up, you have the kid dressed up in a certain uh, baptismal outfit. Spearman wore a dress only because his wife is Catholic. And that's why he's been in therapy for three years. We're not recording this, are we? Oh, we are. Okay, never mind that. That's how we do baptism. That's not how it was for many of the first century, second and third century Christians. It was a movement of God that you didn't leave. It was more of a movement that you stayed and you learned and there was anticipation because you were committing to the deepest level of commitment that you, one could make 
And so you would stay if you got baptized for days, learning, exploring, asking in spiritual fellowship. And that's what's taking place in this chapter. But what's important to understand is the role of the Spirit of God. While our liturgical calendar focuses primarily on the events of Jesus, rightfully so, the amount of time that we spend on the Spirit basically is a season of Pentecost, and we just put numbers. First season, first, second week, third week, fourth week. Can I hear fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth? Because the Spirit can't be confined to any kind of calendar. It doesn't work that way. That's how we order our lives, but that's not how the Spirit works. The Spirit has different timing than what we have. Spirit has a different way to think than what we think. The Spirit's plans are different than our plans. And the Spirit of all of the Trinity, the Godhead, is the most mysterious of all kind, of all of the three, because it's hard for us to wrap our mind around Him. And He is a person. He's not just this force. He's a person. And so I'd like to focus on that today as we look at the competing interests. Not only is the Spirit here, but in verse 32, as we saw, and John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and rested on him. I didn't know him. In other words, John could have gone through baptizing hundreds, if not thousands, and never had known who the Messiah was had not the Spirit directly pointed out to him. He didn't have a council. He didn't go to seminary. He didn't go and get a master's degree or even search the scriptures. Those are all important or can be, but it only is meant to serve the Spirit. The Spirit takes precedence over our institutionalized education. The Spirit takes precedence over our traditions. The Spirit takes precedence over everything because He is God. And so if it was not for the Spirit of God speaking directly to John and then giving him that revelation, John would never have known who Jesus was in the spiritual realm, even though he was right in front of him. Very important to understand the importance of the Spirit. And then, in addition to what we just read, not in the Gospel of John, but in the other three, immediately after Jesus is baptized, he is led by the Spirit into the desert. He doesn't ask his parents, what do you think I should do when I grow up? He doesn't have a guidance counselor. He doesn't go to a pastor. doesn't go to a priest. Only the Spirit he listens to. And as such, the Spirit leads him into the desert for 40 days and for 40 nights by himself. That's so contrary to our world. Try taking your phone and throwing it away for a day. What's your phone say? We just, our minds are constantly being bombarded by voices other than the Spirit. And it's very clear and important to the Spirit of God to bring Jesus into the desert so that he could listen to his voice and recognize his voice so that when he comes out of the desert, he is not subject to the various voices of the people that comprise the synagogue because they don't know God. Only he does. They may know the scriptures. They may know their traditions, but they do not know the spirit, which is why when he goes into the beginning of his ministry, they try to kill him. Jesus talks about the spirit before he goes to the cross, he says in chapter 14 of John that when I send you the Spirit, there is no difference. I mean, there's not going to be any time in which I leave and the Spirit is not with you, guiding you. And as such, the Spirit will remind you of everything that I've said. 
everything. He will do that and lead you into all truth. The other dynamic in, in chapter 16, or lead you into all things, is that the Spirit will lead you into all truth. So as we look at this, while it is focused on Jesus and rightfully so, we cannot forget, nor should we, the role and the personhood of the Spirit of God. Because without the Spirit of God, you don't have God's presence. You just have really good form, really good music, really good show that's spiritually dead. Jesus refers to this with the Pharisees. So what does the Spirit do primarily as the Father? He teaches us discernment. That's one of the things that he does. He teaches us discernment so that we can discern between the voice of God and the voice of the enemy who's trying to lure. And so when Jesus comes out of the desert, he is tempted by the devil. And the devil did not show up in this hideous form. The devil never does. He shows up looking very, very respectable, very enticing, very persuasive. Otherwise, you wouldn't follow him. And the temptations that the devil gives Jesus after those 40 days don't seem to be all that harmful. Why don't you just take some stones and make them into bread? Not that hard. Don't we think about food constantly? Right? What are we going to eat? Where are we going to shop? What are we going to have? Ooh, not too much sugar. Not enough salt. Too much salt. But if you remove food and the desires of the body, begin to hear the Spirit of God underlining all that. And the reason why Jesus does not do what he's tempted to do is not because the temptation is right or wrong, but who says it. He can discern the difference between his feelings and the Spirit of God. So the Spirit gives us discernment. Our entire lives he's working on giving us an increasing ability to discern the voice of God, which is the Word of God, and every other voice that we hear in the world. The second thing that the Spirit does is he reveals things that you would never be able to know on your own. So those are the two roles of the Spirit, if you will. And in order to hear the Spirit, we see this happening all through Scripture. Isaiah, all the prophets. It requires that we have the ability to be quiet and listen to His voice. Now, I know that may sound kind of simplistic. But it's not that easy to do, at least for me. How easy is it for you to just be in your quiet, in your house rather, and not turn on anything? Not a TV, not a radio. Don't call someone. Don't look on your computer, but be quiet. How comfortable would you be in a worship service that was just listening to God? Ten minutes and you're gone? Being quiet is not easy to do, but it's a requirement to be able to being able to hear God. It is essential to being able to hear God. And many times Jesus would remove himself so he could be quiet after the feeding of the 5,000 in the same gospel. Jesus realizes after the miracle that the crowd had perceived that they were going to make him king, force him to be king. So he withdrew himself. When was the last time that you thought or contemplated removing yourself to hear God? Usually we get busy so we don't have to hear the voices in our head. As compared to being quiet, and hearing God. So 
The ability to be quiet is essential. To be able to listen to what he has to say. And, be, and the reason for that in many ways is that while the Spirit has spoken through his word, his written word, he speaks to us individually in the now. In the very moment that we're in. He's spoken in his word which gives us somewhat of a familiarity with his voice. But to hear him in the present requires not only that we be quiet, but to be quiet and not to be thinking about the future. Can you be quiet and not let your mind wander into, oh my gosh, you know what I have to do? I, I just, I forgot to do this. I just um, can't hear the spirit of God. So this is very important. And why is it important? Because as Jesus goes through, you cannot be filled with the Spirit if you can't hear His voice. And we certainly can't follow the Spirit if we can't hear His voice. And we cannot be moved by the power and leading of Him if we can't hear His voice. Without being able to hear the Spirit of God, all we are left with is a creed. Yeah, we believe in Him. What's for coffee? You guys bring anything to eat? What? That's why it's important to be able to be quiet. Now, what keeps us from hearing God in the quiet? And this is where we get to the title of it, the competing interests. The competing interests of our lives are all in here in session. This is where they try to claim turf. This is where they try to rent out space. This is where they try to live, is right in here, the competing interests. And the competing, there's really only three different interests that we have in our lives. There's God's interests, what he, can, what he wants us to know, where he's guiding us and leading us into a, what we can experience. There's God's interests. There's my interests, what I'm interested in doing. And then there's the enemy's interests, those three. And those three tend to vie for attention. The one that we're probably most familiar with that can be the biggest obstacle for us hearing to God are my interests. And that's because we've been taught to think that way. When we get up, we generally think about how our day is going to play out. It's not natural to wake up and simply be quiet and listen to God. That's not natural. That's something that is a discipline. But it's essential to know God's interests. Because if we don't know God's interests, we're only left with our interests to guide us. And the way we think dictates our interests. And the way we think generally speaking, is according to our feelings. It's a big one. We generally think, talking about our self-interest, we generally think according to how we feel, not by his voice. Individually and collectively. I remember when I first got into ministry, and that's a long time ago. But we'd have church decisions come up. I think the supplement was coming out. Remember supplements? Anyone remember supplements? Hymnal supplements? Not, no, not vitamins. <laughs> supplements to the hymnals. I think it was a, a red one. We don't know what to do. So you know what we did? We did probably what most churches do. We put out a survey. What do you feel about it? What do you think about it? What do you think about it? And then, well, I don't like it, and I do. And all of a sudden, it starts stirring people's feelings. Ever experienced that? How many people have experienced the stirring of feelings because we're going to ask everyone what they feel like? 
And we're going to direct their church according to your feelings. And generally, whoever has the strongest feelings gets their way. Even if they're not in the room, don't say this because this person is going to get really angry. You don't want this person to get really angry, right? Am I right? And the whole church, and that's why in a ministry, you can have a a city grow to 78,000 and have a ministry get stuck in the mud. Ain't going anywhere because there's only one opinion that counts and it ain't mine and it ain't yours but if we can't hear his voice we're just stuck well, what about this feeling well i just I'm, I'm really happy i'm disappointed in this i'm angry with it who cares what is it third grade but see this is where the spirit then and the ability to hear comes in because when I think according to my feelings I can't hear God the devil knows this which is why the devil is constantly involved in stirring up feelings stirring up your fear because if the fear is strong enough You can't hear God. If your anger is strong enough and he will goad you into anger, you can't hear God. Peter couldn't hear God in the midst of the trial because he was afraid, so he ran away. The mob was, we call it enticement, but it's goaded into anger. And the enemy's really good at it. He'll get this person that's kind of angry and this person and then hook them up and say, hey, you know what? I'm really ticked off. Yeah, you know what? I'm ticked off. And now it becomes a fun. No one's, <laughs> the enemy will never say this person's angry and this person's angry. Let's get them together and pray. Which is why in general, churches are more concerned about coffee hour than prayer hour. Just a fact. More concerned with those kind of things. The enemy will use shame and guilt and anger and accusation to stir our feelings so greatly. Our shame feels so great, I can't go to the prayer group, I'm just too ashamed. Boom, defeated. I'm afraid of what people might think. Boom, defeated. And while the whole world is in need of God, The enemy will maintain his presence, right? We can do everything perfect as a church, and it doesn't matter if you have the lights and you have the big bands and you have whatever it matters. It doesn't matter the form of it if it's designed to evoke feeling and not obedience, it will lead you away from God. That's why if you don't have a certain hymn or you don't, people will get really upset because I really like the hymns. It makes me feel good. Well, that's good. I'm a musician. I like to feel good. But that is not my ability to hear God. And as a musician, I love to worship God. But sometimes worshiping God can get in the way of me hearing God. We have a worship and music committee. We don't have a prayer committee. It's just how we're set up. And generally speaking, when people go to churches, they go to them for the first time wondering, am I going to like this? As compared to where is God sending me? Where is God leading me to be a part of a movement? And that's a different way of thinking that can only take place when we can hear the Spirit of God. We have a whole culture that's being driven by the thoughts that come out of intense feelings. And it's a ploy of the enemy. Not just my feelings, but other people's feelings. Well, what if we did this? Well, what would this person think? I'd, well, there, here's another one. Like, you know, pastor, some people have been telling me who I, I can't tell. I can't tell you. You know that one? I just, no, you want it. 
And that's okay. But the feelings now that are surrounding all that are not of God. I've never had someone say, you know, people have been coming up to me and saying this, and I took it to the Lord in prayer, and this is what the Lord directed me. Not once. Because we don't train people to do that. So this is so key because without the Spirit of God, a ministry is dead. It may look good, and it may be exciting, and it may make you feel good, but it's dead. I'll say that again. It may look really good. Oh, we're going to do a renovation, which is great. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But that doesn't mean that we have the spirit of God. You may have temples. You may have. And this is why, in part, Jesus' conflict in his entire ministry was wherever he went to a congregation or the temple. They wanted to kill him. They had no spirit, but they had form, and they had tradition, and they even had the scriptures, and they read the scriptures, but no spirit. Every person that is moved by the spirit understands the need for prayer and quiet. And sometimes in my own life, what gets in the way of the spirit is serving ministry because this church is not the spirit. It is a formation or a manifestation, but their church is never to be worshiped. And I have worshiped it. Yeah. Don't upset these people because if they leave, you won't get paid. And that's what they hold over you. Isn't that right? Come on, you belong to a church. Isn't that right? Money talks. Thank you. And you work for us. You give us what we want. I know this is hitting home because it hit home for me. I'm ashamed of how I acted. I am ashamed of my disobedience to the will of God because I was afraid. Now, bear in mind, when I came into ministry, I was 29 years old. There's a lot of people that were my elders. I give myself a little slack. I was a punk. I had good hair. <laughs> that was short-lived. <laughs> that, that was short-lived. When you see Jesus and what's taking place here, he's not concerned about his feelings. He has them. They need to be acknowledged. They really do. They're important. But his feelings were subject to the leading of the Spirit. He didn't care about other people's opinions or their feelings. He didn't, he didn't even care about his own mother's feelings, which is a foo hoo hoo. If you've ever had my mother, I can still hear her voice. My friends in Christ, I believe that God wants to do great things, but he's not going to be able to do anything if myself and collectively we're so dang concerned with our feelings that we can't hear his voice. It's a trick because we've been taught in our whole culture, follow your dreams. No one ever says follow God's spirit. No one. No one ever says follow God's spirit. Follow your dreams. Follow your passions. Follow. No, don't follow any of that. It will lead you astray. Be aware of them. Enjoy them for what they are. God gave them to you, but they're not God's spirit. There will be churches that will be closing because of that. And we just may be one of them. I don't know. I hope not. I don't think that's in God's plan. But it not, would not be the first time that people's feelings superseded God's plans. All I know is to the best of my ability, as for me and my life, I want to serve the Lord. And that will require being very diligent in learning to hear his voice. Very diligent. People will come to you and say, please pray for me in a place of turmoil. 
And you're going to be able to, you're going to need to be able to hear God's voice to know how to pray. And guess what? Prayer is not something that you vocationally get off the hook with. I don't have to pray because I hire someone to pay it for me. Pray for me. Uh uh-uh. That's not how the Spirit of God works. So my friends in Christ, as we go forward, anointed by God, called by God, not chosen. You didn't choose him. He chose you. And as we go forward, understanding that he chose us, the importance of being able to listen to his voice, may it be the highest priority we have in our lives or one of the highest priorities. And may the living God, may the living God who gives us his peace, who is among us now as he was his first disciples, may he have his way and be glorified through his people in our hearts and how we think. In Jesus' name, amen.